Oh, hi. I'm Uatu the Watcher, and you caught me spying on a girl's locker room thousands of miles away. Speaking of me spying on things, let's talk about my comic book, What If. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. One of my favorite types of comic book stories, at least within superhero comics, is the alternate take on continuity. Now, DC Comics did this from the 1950s all the way up through the 1980s, most of the time in Superman, where they would sometimes just have a completely different take on things, and they would often label those as imaginary stories. As compared to all the non-fiction Superman stories they normally told. Anyway, in 1977, February of 1977 to be specific, Marvel Comics introduced their own take on this. Uh, it was called What If. Now, the premise of What If was a little different because it was an ongoing comic book series, but every issue was by a different creative team and would feature some unique twist of fate that happened to a popular character or an important storyline that took the existing stories we knew and took them in a different direction. So What If was kind of unique in that it wasn't necessarily presenting a story for a broad general audience. It was aimed squarely at existing fans of these characters. Characters. Each issue was hosted by the cosmic being known as The Watcher, who would mention a key moment in Marvel Comics history and then show us a parallel reality, where things went down a different path. Each issue would focus on a different story and use different creative teams. The first volume of this series ran for 47 issues through 1984. A second volume ran from 1989 through 1998, across 114 issues. And then further volumes would come out most years since 2006, with only five or six issues. One of the most fun parts of What If is that the writers were never bound by any restrictions on resetting things to a status quo. So the stories could be about anything, and the main characters died off with alarming frequency. Now, What If wasn't exactly a horror comic, but it absolutely became a trope that a lot of these stories could end with the entire universe getting destroyed. Obviously, these writers could go any direction their imagination took them, but I want to provide a brief overview on some of the types of stories that tended to get told within What If. We could have a particular hero dying or surviving and showing what that character's effect on the world was. We could have a character gaining different superpowers. We could have a professional creator showing us how things could have gone differently on their own famous story. A lot of times an individual would gain vast cosmic powers and reshape the world. And sometimes a new concept would get introduced in What If that would later become introduced into regular Marvel continuity. Let's start off with a look at some notable issues that would either feature a character dying or not dying, and what that did to the world around them. You could think of this a lot like the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Let's start off with the most infamous example. That would be issue 10 of the second volume, which asks, what if Punisher's family hadn't been killed? In this version, a rainy day sends Frank Castle and his family home from the park so they aren't killed by criminals that day. Frank becomes a police officer, but witnesses corruption and reports it. So dirty cops come to his house and kill his family. So what would happen if Frank Castle's family wasn't killed? Apparently, they'd still be killed, and he'd still become the Punisher. A fascinating issue was number 24 of Volume 1, which asks, what if Gwen Stacy hadn't died? When the Green Goblin killed Gwen Stacy, it was a seminal moment for Spider-Man. In this story, Spidey successfully catches his girlfriend and proposes to her. He then goes after Green Goblin, who he now knows is Norman Osborn. There's a beautiful moment where Harry Osborn defends his cruel and insane father from Spider-Man because he still loves his father. This snaps Norman out of his insanity long enough to turn himself in. The downside is that Peter ends up on the run after his boss exposes his secret identity. In a story two years later, in issue 46, Spider-Man's identity is learned by his uncle in the story, What If Uncle Ben Had Lived? 
In that story, Aunt May was killed by a burglar. And when Peter hears his uncle beating himself up over letting it happen, he argues that it wasn't his fault. Ben calmly points out that Peter should listen to his own advice, helping this version of Spider-Man bypass years of self-blame. Spider-Man factors into a lot of these stories, like what if Kraven had killed Spider-Man? What if Punisher had killed Spider-Man? What if Scarlet Spider had killed Spider-Man? And believe it or not, there are actual issues of what if that don't feature Spider-Man. Let's talk about another topic, which is a superhero gaining different superpowers or somebody else gaining their superpowers. One fun take on things is issue 12 from volume 1, showing us what would happen if Rick Jones became the Hulk instead of Bruce Banner. Bruce helps Rick by locking him away in a high-tech vault at night. This Hulk is less angry, and he ends up joining the Avengers after battling Loki instead of ditching them. Rick also goes through versions of his adventures, including training with Captain America and beating up Hydra, and being joined with Captain Marvel and battling Annihilus. This mostly results in Hulk talking like how old writers at the time guessed how teenagers spoke. Don't jive Hulk with fancy lingo, bug man! Hulk doesn't dig it! Another cool story is issue 44 of Volume 2, where writer Kurt Busiek shows us what could have happened if Punisher became the host of Venom instead of Eddie Brock. This version of Venom shoots bullets out of his arms instead of webs. He kills Kingpin, which prompts Spider-Man, Moon Knight, and Daredevil to team up to confront him. Frank Castle ends up communicating with the symbiote and giving it an ultimatum. Stop forcing him to be angry and fight at night when he's sleeping, or he'll kill himself. The symbiote realizes Punisher would do it, and agrees to let Punisher be in complete control. Another interesting look at an alternate set of powers is issue 52, a few months later, where Doctor Doom's college experiment to contact his mother in Hell still backfires, but his journey takes him to the Himalayas, where he encounters the Ancient One and becomes his pupil, becoming Sorcerer Supreme before Doctor Strange goes on his quest. When Doctor Strange arrives, looking for a cure for his broken hands, Doctor Doom simply cuts them off and replaces them with robot hands. Doctor Doom journeys to Hell and successfully saves his mother's soul. He later dies defending Earth from Dormammu, but when Doctor Strange comes to operate on his dying body, Doom has his robots kidnap Doctor Strange so that he can swap minds and continue living. Doctor Doom is still a dick. In rare instances, there have been stories where comic book professionals have returned to the stories that they made famous and done their own alternate take on their own work. Greg Pak wrote three versions of stories where his Planet Hulk arc went differently. In one, Hulk lands on the peaceful planet the Illuminati intended him to be sent to. Hulk loves the peace, but Bruce Banner keeps trying to find a way home. After untold time, Banner relents and learns to appreciate the cat creatures that Hulk cares for. Seemingly millennia later, we see that the cat creatures have evolved into people and think of their guardian Hulk as an old myth. But a small child sees that Hulk and Banner have merged and still live, protecting them from the shadows. John Byrne had a long and beloved run on Fantastic Four, but also wrote and illustrated issue 36 of the first volume of What If to show a world where the Fantastic Four never got their superpowers. We see that even without their powers, the Fantastic Four works as a family, a team, and explorer adventurers. They get tasked by the government to investigate and take down Mole Man, which they accomplish. Ultimately, Mole Man nukes his kingdom. Frank Miller did a well-regarded issue where he shows what would have happened if Elektra hadn't died. The answer is basically, Daredevil lives a happy life. It's actually not one of my personal favorites because it feels really depressing to realize how good things could have been for Daredevil, but they're not. One obscure issue is Volume 2's issue 56, which features writer Simon Furman and artist Jeff Sr tell a story about what would have happened if their Marvel UK creation, Death's Head, a cyborg bounty hunter, hadn't been killed by Death's Head 2, a character that they had no hand in creating in the mainstream continuity. In their version, Death's Head teleports away from being killed by the cyborg entity named Minion. He gathers some Avengers who are all taken out by Minion, but weaken him enough for Death's Head to get the win. 
Because What If allows its creators to do anything they want, it's amazing how many stories feature a character gaining vast cosmic powers and reshaping the world in their image. Issue 101 of the second volume features Archangel following Apocalypse's plan. He starts by saving his teammate Cyclops when he kills Sebastian Shaw, but he goes on to flat out kill Sabretooth. Things jump forward to Apocalypse waking up and realizing Archangel went way further than he ever intended. Apocalypse wants to cull the weak, but Archangel reasoned that anyone he could defeat was weak and killed off everyone, hero and villain alike. The art isn't great, but the story is cool. Volume 7 of What If centered around alternate takes on mega crossover events. In their Secret Wars story, Doctor Doom gains the omnipotence of the Beyonder. He defeats heroes and gods, saves his mother's soul, and ultimately decides to end all conflict, rebirthing the universe and himself. In the Marvel crossover event Acts of Vengeance, Spider-Man briefly gained the powers of Captain Universe, which bestow themselves on people during times of crisis, then move on. But in issue 31 of the second series, Spidey keeps those powers, but he does an absolutely terrible job with them. He tries to cure his enemy Hobgoblin of his ruined face, but ends up giving him Peter Parker's face, since he doesn't know what Hobgoblin looked like. He scares Venom into trying to be good and to be the new Spider-Man. Then Spidey loses all his chill and demands Thor bring rain to the deserts. He loses his temper and eventually just ends up using his cosmic powers to make everyone think of themselves as equals. In the 200th ever issue of What If, the evil Norman Osborn gains control of the Infinity Gauntlet and uses it to bring back his father who was abusive. He ultimately commits the biggest self-own of all time by wiping his father out of existence and then realizing that means he won't exist either. That's the kind of crazy story that I love. Another great one is when Conan the Barbarian accidentally makes the X-Men destroy the entire universe. Conan appeared in several issues of the first volume, including appearing in the modern day where he decided to dress like a pimp. In Volume 2's Issue 16, Wolverine fights Conan. The story is set during the Dark Phoenix Saga. In that story, Wolverine was sent through a mind-altering journey throughout time by the Watcher. In this version, he accidentally falls out of time in Conan's era. They fight, and later, Wolverine has a sorcerer open a time portal to get back home. But Conan accidentally falls through. He witnesses the X-Men battling Jean Grey, thinks they're attacking his friend Red Sonya, and knocks out Cyclops with a rock. Without Cyclops there, Jean Grey is lost to the Phoenix, who destroys everything. I love that all that stuff at the end happens within one page. That is some compressed storytelling. Another type of trope in What If was basically just having different superheroes join S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, we had what if Daredevil joined S.H.I.E.L.D.? What if Punisher joined S.H.I.E.L.D.? What if Wolverine joined S.H.I.E.L.D.? Not that interesting, actually. Anyway, the final trope I want to talk about right now is the idea of a writer introducing a concept that was so good that years later, it ended up getting adapted into regular continuity and it became an established, real story. For instance, what if issue 9 from the first series is the idea of an Avengers group fighting in the 1950s? That later became canon in the normal continuity, and the group was known as the Agents of Atlas. The following issue featured Jane Foster gaining the powers of Thor, and for some reason, everyone calls her Thordis. She later became Thor in a long run by writer Jason Aaron. In 1990, the comic explored the idea of Professor X gaining the powers of Juggernaut. This powerful and evil version of Professor X came about six years before Onslaught, who was very similar. Issue 30 of the first volume explored the idea of what if Spider-Man's clone had lived. The story resolves itself within one issue, with Peter and his clone deciding to share a life together so that they can help maintain Spider-Man's secret identity. That's a lot more efficient than the clone saga in Spider-Man that took over two years from 1994 to 1996 to tell. The comic even had time to fit in a short Inhuman story at the end. Arguably the most successful What If issue was Volume 2's issue 105, 
which posits that Peter Parker and Mary Jane's daughter, May, survives and grows up to become Spider-Girl. That ended up getting spun off into its own title, which lasted 30 issues. Despite the darkness the title could have, there were also sometimes some really happy moments in it. In one story, J. Jonah Jameson adopts Peter Parker, and after learning he's Spider-Man, comes to accept it. A story taking on the Annihilation storyline shows what would happen if the Annihilation Wave made it to Earth, and supervillains stand side by side with superheroes to defend Earth. It even has Captain America and Iron Man repairing their recently sundered friendship over the events of Civil War, which pale in comparison to protecting humanity. On the other hand, sometimes things went really dark. There was a story where Juggernaut outlived everybody else and just lived on a barren planet with no other life for all time. Or there was the story where Wolverine became King of the Vampires and it was basically like an early version of Marvel Zombies with superheroes that are vampires taking out everybody in New York. And ultimately they're taken out when the ghost of Doctor Strange possesses Punisher. Because at this point in time, nobody realized how popular Blade would become. The appeal of What If is that you can do anything with characters and settings that readers already have a great deal of affection for. It allows the creative teams to tell stories in a type of shorthand, evoking emotional responses based on how well we already know these heroes. While not every issue is good, every issue is pretty entertaining, and some are incredibly resonant depending on how much love you have for a character or storyline. If you're curious about where to start with What If, aside from some of the stories that I've outlined here, or if you want to look for a story that you especially enjoyed and see what Marvel's alternate take on it is, chances are they've already done one, I'd recommend looking for stories by writers Kurt Busiek, Jim Valentino, and Peter B. Gillis. I think all three of those guys did several What If stories that were very, very good. Meanwhile, back at DC, after the 80s, they started their Elseworlds line, which is a much less specific version of alternate continuity stories. Um, I think The Nail is a fantastic one. Gotham by Gaslight by Mike Mignola is fantastic. I also really like Red Sun with art by Dave Johnson. Those are some of the best uh, DC ones that I enjoy, but your mileage may vary there. Uh, I love alternate storylines. I like when Star Trek shows us the Mirror Universe, for instance. In fact, there's a Mirror Universe beer out there, and I was thinking of drinking it for this episode, but I figured that was kind of superfluous. Uh, something like Back to the Future. That's an alternate history take on things. And of course, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. They're all interesting just to show how something could shift with just one simple twist of fate. Oh, there was also a Doctor Who episode called, I think, Turn Left. That was very much like an issue of What If. That's worth looking up. Anyway, let's put all that aside. I hope you enjoyed it. Let's take a quick look at what kind of fan art showed up this week. All right, I've got nine pieces of artwork, starting with this by Asifur Rahman from Bangladesh, who reminds me of that time I ate a bunch of hot peppers. J. Andrew World returns with this piece, showing how tired I am this month. Very accurate. Uh, John Stringer shows what would happen if Venom took over my show, while his fiancée Lucy shows me joining the Defenders as Captain Comic Tropes. I should actually do that. Joseph Pulsifer shows me getting my comeuppance as the tropes fight back against me. Keith Stoll refers back to my review of Golden Age Hero 7-Eleven as he maintains a clever disguise. Masiak returns with two more pieces he made about the show. I think they're both pretty fantastic. Thank you very much, Masiak. Miles Durkey returns as well with a very fun piece showing Infotron. So I'm starting to think that you guys actually want to see more of him. Finally, cartoonist Scott Underwood delivers this amazing cartoon of me reviewing the Mad Balls comic, and I actually did own an issue of that back in the day. All right, everybody, I've got eight numbers written out here, eight uh, scraps of paper with numbers. Uh, J. Andrew World uh, said that he didn't need to be in the running. He just wanted to send in some artwork, so thank you for that. So I'm going to drop all the uh, numbers here in the uh, Gotcha Pond prize bag and reach in a few times, shuffle them around. 
Uh, if you'd like to have your artwork featured on this program, uh, send that along with any social media links or website links you'd like to include to comictropes at gmail.com. As long as it has something to do with this show, I will feature it and you'll be in the running to win a Gachapon prize. All right, number six. Let me go look up who number six is. All right, number six is Maciek, uh, who I believe is in Poland, so that's going to probably cost me a little something. I'm going to reach in here and uh, reach for something on the smaller side because uh, it's all based on weight. But uh, this is kind of cool. It looks like it's a, a Power Ranger action figure of some sort, like a, or, or a figurine. I know you can't make that out too well, but it's whatever the current Power Rangers show was a few months ago when I was in Japan. I think it was based on police, like policemen Power Rangers. Uh, this particular guy might be red. I can't quite tell. But anyway, I'll send that your way, Maciek. Uh, thank you all for the wonderful fan art. That's so fun. Uh, it really helps me feel positive about comics in general, to see so much creativity. Uh, I really love it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, from here on, for the rest of the month, I'm going with more horror-themed comics. So um, I hope that that's fun. I love horror. I love October and Halloween. I just love it. So that's the direction I'm going for the next three episodes. I think you'll like them. I think it's going to be a blast. We're going to see some obscure stuff, some mainstream stuff, some, uh, some stuff from foreign countries. So it's a wide variety of titles. Thank you all for being uh, viewers, for subscribing, sharing stuff on social media, and of course a special thanks to all my patrons on Patreon. I appreciate that. I have some rewards over there. If you're so inclined, take a look on Patreon. And uh, I think that'll do it for this week. Let's get, uh, let's get done here so that we can come back with a horrific episode next week. Ooh, ooky spooky. All right, folks. Uh, until next time, keep reading comics.